Hi, I'm Sam. Over quarantine, I've really come to like some things that I really wasn't into before. I learned to cook for holidays, write song lyrics, a whole bunch of good stuff. But the things I came to like that are relevant to this video are movies and historical fiction. Both things I was okay with before, but would have never been my first choice. But I came to understand and truly enjoy them. Now, of course, those two things can combine. And for me, a couple months ago, they combined into the 2008 film Pan's Labyrinth, directed by Guillermo del Toro. I really love this movie. The atmosphere was great, I love some of the characters, and overall, I think it became one of my favorites. Before this movie, I heard about little bits and pieces of the Spanish Civil War, but never in a fully coherent way. Watching this absolutely changed that. It portrayed a fairly terrifying reality, a country controlled by totalitarian forces, lacking any empathy towards anyone not on their side. A small militia of those trying to fight, winning back their freedom bit by bit, but to no larger success. After looking into the facts of the war more, I can pretty confidently say that Pan's Labyrinth brings much truth about the Spanish Civil War. It does this in many ways, but I'll be looking at it through the lens of the characters. Specifically, I'll be looking at Ophelia, a young girl who's the protagonist of the film, Mercedes, a double agent for the militia, Vidal, the captain of the local fascists, and the Fawn, a character who serves as a gateway between the real and the fantastical. Did I mention that this is a fantasy movie too? We'll get to that later. First, Ophelia. Ophelia is our protagonist, a young girl forced to move to a base in the countryside with her mother, who is pregnant and carrying the child of the captain of said base. She is the only one in the film able to see the fantasy elements, making her appear to be the subject of a prophecy read in the beginning of the film about a princess who was lost in the human world. The experiences of Ophelia, Ophelia mirror those of the experiences of civilians during the Spanish Civil War, which is to say her experiences were bad. The civilian experience during the war was miserable. It was one of the first times in history in which civilians were specifically targeted by bombings. What you're seeing on screen right now is a painting titled Guernica, made by Pablo Picasso. This painting was made to commemorate the bombing of Guernica, a Spanish city that was effectively destroyed with countless lives lost and a great amount of harm caused. In addition to these attacks, Franco's armies would kill anyone who remotely stood against them. In total, an estimated 17... In total, an estimated 170,000 people were killed outside of combat by Francoists, according to historian Paul Preston in his book, The Spanish Holocaust. Many neighboring countries refused to answer the civilians' cries for help, instead signing non-intervention pacts with Franco and providing aid to his rebels. The average civilian during the Spanish Civil War was in an immense amount of danger, something which is reflected in Ophelia. Throughout the film, she can only receive help from Mercedes and the Fawn, with everyone else around her being seemingly allied with Franco's brutal regime. Unfortunately, she couldn't escape her danger for long. This is where the spoilers start, by the way. At the end of the movie, she is killed, shot while trying to escape to the fantasy world with Captain Vidal on her tail. Any child death on screen is horrific, but this is especially so as we see her bleeding out on the ground while her baby brother is ripped from her arms by her killer. Fortunately, she receives her reward after this, a place in the court of the king of the fantasy realm. But this doesn't change the brutal impact of the scene. It's heartbreaking, just like what happened to so many like her in the Spanish Civil War. The next experience we'll focus on is that of the leftists fighting against Franco and his forces. The character who embodies this most is Mercedes, a double agent pretending to be on Vidal's side as his servant while actually helping the militia hiding in the woods nearby. Just like the civilians, anyone who participated in any left-wing politics would lightly be killed. But when we look at the experiences of Luis Ortiz Alfau, one of the last living former members of the Republican army, we can see that it didn't stop there. He had to bear witness to some of the most horrifying events of the war. He was on a team trying to rescue people from the ruins of Guernica, 
describing to an interviewer how much blood and death he saw around him among the destruction, something truly scarring. This is also true for Mercedes, as she had to watch a friend of hers undergo an unanesthetized amputation due to lack of medicine and an injured and infected leg. That would surely traumatize anyone. In addition, Alfaro described how when he returned from his duties, he pretty much couldn't find a job. Many jobs were only available for those who, quote-unquote, fought for the right side of the war. This historical fact greatly contextualizes why Mercedes and her militia are camped out in the woods in the first place, why they were still fighting. It's because at the point in the war where the movie takes place, Franco is seemingly already won. They have no option but to keep fighting his allies wherever they can, for they have no normal life that they can go back to. This is a really sad detail, but unfortunately it's true to life and the experience of those who tried their best to resist Franco. Time for the big bad, Captain Vidal. The leader of a local group of Franco's men, he is the antagonist of the film, which comes through from the moment we meet him. He greets Ophelia's mother in the car that took her to his location and immediately insists that she get into a wheelchair. Even when she says that she is capable of walking despite her pregnant state, he does not take no for an answer. Why is this? We'll get back to that in a bit. First, let's talk a bit about fascism in Spain. Though Franco was allied with other fascist leaders like Hitler and Mussolini, his specific fascist party, entitled the Falange, had different properties than them. While other fascist movements made an effort to come off as populist in nature, his was anything but that. The Falange consisted of aristocrats, wealthy landowners, and members of the military, all people who would be portrayed as high society. For all intents and purposes, they wanted to reinforce hierarchy, to transform Spain back into an authoritarian state after they became a republic. And what does the reinforcement of hierarchy mean socially? Well, for starters, misogyny, which brings us back to that scene. As someone who believes in what Franco believes, Vidal needs his wife to sit down and to appear weak in order to validate his worldview. He holds hierarchy above all else, so much that it seems at some points he has an active death wish in order to make it seem like he's serving Franco to the best of his ability. Overall, the way Vidal holds himself and others is very consistent for what fascism was like in Spain. This is shown even more with the last character I'll talk about. Now, for the last character, it's time for some fawn facts. Sorry, I had to. In Greek mythology, fawns were quite literally party animals. They were portrayed as fun-loving and carefree, trying to bring all into their raucous parties and make sure everyone had a good time. They were even followers of Dionysus, the god of winemaking. Overall, very merry, very joyous, very inclusive. When you compare that to someone like Vidal, you can see the clear differences that were intended. Vidal is joyless and utterly unemotional, only drinking alcohol when solitary as something to seemingly add to his sour moods instead of softening them. He is the perfect opposite of historical representations of fawns. Even though the fawn, as seen in the film, is more of a trickster than a partier, you can still see, much, see how much of a soulful and fantastical aura he has in his interactions with Ophelia, whom he seems to genuinely care about, driving, to her, driving her to succeed and giving her aid. Compare that to Vidal, who threatens her with violence and eventually kills her in pursuit of his goals. This leads to one of the greatest truths told by the film. In theory, the actual monster would be more monstrous than a man. But in truth, Vidal and the fascist ideology he represents is so much more horrific than anything the Fawn did. This observation was inspired by Ian Danskin of Innuendo Studios, who made another video on this topic. The greatest truth Pan's Labyrinth can give to us is what Spanish citizens and Republican soldiers experienced was horrific. And it expertly shows this with the comparison of all of its fantasy elements, especially the Fawn, being such a direct foil to Captain Vidal. Overall, Pan's Labyrinth is an excellent example of how aspects of historical fiction can deeply inform the viewer about what certain parts of history were like, just like it did for me. The horrors of life during the Spanish Civil War are fully portrayed, with every element of the film going towards showing how Franco, his men, 
and his ideology were completely monstrous, even more so than actual.